on with the event. Dr. Shannon Shah, balanced careers in human rights advocacy, journalism, theatre and music in his latest Malaysia before relocating to London in 2010. He holds a doctorate in sociology of religion from King's College London and is the author of The Making of a Gay Muslim, Religion, Sexuality and Identity in Malaysia and Britain. He is a fellow at the London-based Muslim Institute, contributing regularly to its flagship quarterly publication, Critical Muslim. He is currently the national coordinator for the Faith for the Climate Network. He also conducts research on minority religions and alternative spiritualities at the educational charity Inform, which is based at KCL, and teaches religious studies at the University of London's Distance Learning Divinity Programme. So I'll hand you over to Dr. Sean now just to say hello and then I'll start with the questions. Hi, thanks so much Marianne and thank you to Catherine, everyone at Clear at Kings, to Kate and Ali tonight and to all of you. It's a real pleasure to be here. So and I'm looking forward to our discussion this evening. Great, so it's going to be it's a wide ranging discussion, of course, I think kind of mirroring your career and interests as well. <laughs> Uh, can't really help that, can we? So I think I'd like to start with um, touching on some of your older work, probably. Um, looking at the moral and theological arguments um, about inclusion and acceptance of queer Muslims in Islam. I think this is a such a core and interesting piece of your work. It'd be great to hear, hear a kind of summary of it. Yes, thank you. Well, um, maybe a bit of a longer summary, because what I'm going to try and do is something that it's, it's just a new way that I want to try and explain this. Um, so I'm actually not going to start with doctrines and sacred texts, like what Islam says about sexuality and gender. What I want to do is try and lay the groundwork for the traditional, quote unquote, Islamic position on sexuality and gender. And then we'll see what the moral and ethical arguments are for inclusion and acceptance and otherwise. So I think in a nutshell, if we look at how traditional Islamic jurisprudence developed um, around sexual and gender relations, there's very much this question of what, what are the implications of certain acts and do they necessarily imply concrete identities, sexual or gender identities? And just to be very frank, because this is how it appeared in Islamic jurisprudence, the legality of sexual relations really revolved around the rightful usage of genitalia. It was heteronormative, it was patriarchal, it was phallocentric, but basically the only lawful place for a penis was in the vagina of the body that, you know, the, the, the body that the penis was married to. I mean, that's really clumsily put, but you know, that, that is basically the legality of sexual relations in Islam. Any other usage of these genitals was unlawful, but there were different degrees of unlawfulness depending on whether penetration had happened. Um, and there were different gradations of punishment depending on people's status. So were you a free citizen or were you a slave? What is your mental health status? Are you of sound mind or not? Um, are you an adult or are you prepubescent? So depending on these different statuses, the punishments would be different for different sexual infractions. So there would be situations where um, penetrative sex outside of heterosexual marriage was punishable by the highest degree of punishment possible. And there were times when even penetrative male homosexual sex was not punishable at all. So for example, if, you know, I might be getting the details wrong, but if two male slaves had anal sex with each other, the punishment would be very different from a free man in a heterosexual marriage having homosexual relations with another free man who was also in a heterosexual marriage. So all these different statuses matter and they sort of disappear when we ask questions now about you know, LGBTQI inclusion in Muslim sacred texts or in Muslim societies and so on. And this is just the sexual relations bit. Um, I haven't really touched on the question of gender identity as well, the different kinds of gender pluralisms that existed in Muslim societies throughout history and in different locations around the world. So there are third gender cultures in South Asia, for example, Indonesia, Malaya, 
um, West Africa, East Africa. So there are all these situations where it's not that there was equality, but gender pluralisms were tolerated as long as people knew their place in the hierarchy. And as long as if they had same-sex relationships, it followed a heterogender model. So if it was two men, then one man had to be discernibly the man, the male figure, and the other one, the feminized figure, and you know, so on. So with this summary, now that I've just laid the groundwork, um, now we can discuss sacred texts and moral considerations when it comes to LGBTQI inclusion in Islam. Because texts need to be interpreted and they are interpreted differently in different historical and social circumstances. So having said all that, what does the Quran say about homosexuality? It actually says nothing. The word doesn't exist in the Quran, right? Um, it's very much a reiteration of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah that we find in the Hebrew scriptures. And there are some cryptic references to, you know, two women who behave immorally, but we don't really know what that immoral immorality refers to. Um, and there's also a difference between how texts were interpreted versus did they make it into Islamic law? Did they make it into Islamic jurisprudence? What was the basis for certain rulings? Could those rulings change over time? And what eventually gets codified in the modern nation state? So where I come from, for example, the Islamic family laws or Islamic criminal laws, what they say about sexual relations um, is very much an amalg amalgamation of uh, Victorian mores, legacies of colonialism, as well as particular readings of Islamic jurisprudence throughout history. So I guess I will stop there for now in case you want to clarify things. Have I gone too far? Have I not gone far enough? So I'm waiting for you to prod me. Um, so I think one of the one of the really interesting points you said there was about the kind of um, different degrees of punishment and lawfulness depending on your position in society. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on that kind of in terms of class or gender or even nationality maybe, kind of how those factors intersected in a historical sense and maybe whether they do now. Yeah, I think I definitely one of the things that um, is missing from this picture when we talk about gender and sexual relations in Islam now uh, is this idea of socioeconomic status and class. So slavery, how did the institution of slavery inform uh, rulings about not, not just LGBTQI people or non-heteronormative sexualities, but even heterosexual marriage? How was that structured around the idea of slavery? Um, and what, the, what were the assumptions that were made about women's duties in marriage, you know, what does a free woman do? What does she not do compared to a woman slave and so on? Um, I'm not really equipped to go into the detail of it, but there's a lot to uncover there. And there's a scholar in America, an Islamic feminist scholar called Kisha Ali, whose work very much focuses on that. And that's the argument she makes. She's like, if we are going to talk about gender and sexuality in Islam now, there's no way to do it without talking about how the institution of slavery affected the way we think about gender relations. Um, and this is a complicated issue because as with uh, Christianity, it's slavery has a complex relationship in the history of Muslim societies. You know, there are arguments by progressives that the Quran actually is moving towards manumission, is moving towards the abolition of slavery. But actually slavery remains legal in Muslim legal texts. It's just that you have to treat your slave kindly. You have to, you know, there are all these rights and responsibilities. So it's not slavery like the antebellum South in America, but it still exists as an institution. And one of the things about the institution of slavery is, in Islam is the sexual availability of slaves to their masters. Whether they are male slaves or female slaves, you know, this assumption that they will be sexually available to the master. So when we talk about certain things being illegal in Islam or forbidden in terms of sexual relations, then, you know, it changes when there is this hierarchy of social class and gender and age and status and so on. So that's the missing link. I don't really have a view on that at the moment, except to say, pay attention, we have to pay attention to that. 
I think relating to that as well, what you said about um, colonialism and that kind of legacy that melds together with um, more traditional Islamic jurisprudence, as you said, um, in Malaysia, kind of how do you think um, kind of generally the, the influence, like with a lot of discourse, kind of the influence of colonialism and the vestiges of colonialism are, a bit, are underplayed or forgotten about or just ignored in favour of a kind of more extreme view of um, what Islamic jurisprudence is. Does that mean, yeah. Yeah, and I think Malaysia is an interesting case study when it comes to this, because with the experience of British colonialism, you know, Islam became an instrument for the British to organize its colonial rule, to divide the population, to sort of create hierarchies in terms of race. And because, you know, the Malay Sultanates were Muslim, so this kind of you know, boundary that was created around Islam and this management of Islam was a way of managing the population and um, imposing indirect rule through the institutions of the Sultanate. But on the other hand, the British also introduced ideas of race, very Victorian ideas. And, you know, in, in, in the Malay archipelago, in what is now Malaysia, especially in West Malaysia, it wasn't just constructions of native races. What is a Malay? Who was a Chinese? Who was an Indian? What kind of Indian were you? You know, were you a Northern Indian and therefore seen as more acceptable? Or were you Southern Indian and therefore treated as bonded labor? These were sort of racial categories that the British created that are very related to class as well. Um, so the British fostered a kind of Malay elite that would defend a particular idea of Islam but that idea of Islam then became so uh, imbued with Victorian mores of sexuality. So in some ways, post-independence, you know, this kind of Victorian obsession with sodomy became internalized by Malay elites, right? And so this is the legacy that continues in Malaysia now, this kind of obsession that's, you know, kind of an internalized elite uh, way of governing the population and, you know, uh, I think Foucault would have a lot to say in terms of biopolitics and governmentality in Malaysia. Um, I'm not equipped to do that at the moment because um, I haven't read my Foucault recently. But um, yeah, so it's these are how the intersections work in a country like Malaysia. When we talk about Islamic jurisprudence, how is it co-constructed alongside constructions of race, constructions of economic status, um, constructions of religion, um, constructions of sexuality and so on. Thank you. Um, I think, so thinking about kind of implications today, um, I think uh, how, um, how can the experiences of queer Muslims kind of, what can they teach us about uh, key moments and include, you know, key moments, key political moments, particularly so recent ones, so Me Too, Black Lives Matter. How can those experiences kind of inform each other, do you think? So something that really upset me recently over the last year or so, I mean, this was before coronavirus, uh, was the protests by Muslim parents at the Anderton Park School in Birmingham against the teaching of Relig uh, reproductive and sexual education in primary schools. And the way that it was presented in the mass media, even in the progressive outlets like The Guardian, it seemed to be quite a black and white picture about, you know, these, these were homophobic Muslim parents who just didn't respect the fact that, you know, LGBTQ people have a right to exist and that, you know, that, that there are these rights and uh, remedies in the UK now for uh, LGBTQ people. So it was very much, you know, these, this liberal conception of LGBTQ identity and then these Muslims on this side. And I think, even though I don't agree with the protesters, even though I think some of the things they were saying, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm a gay Muslim, I'm a queer Muslim, I was really offended by some of the things they said, but there was a part of me that also thought, why aren't we talking about how 
Muslims are so over monitored in the UK, you know, how counterterrorism policies like prevent really put Muslims under the spotlight all the time where, you know, one of the ministers in the coalition government's cabinet, um, this was pre-2015, where she said, you know, homophobia could be a sign of radicalization or something. And she was clearly referring to Muslim students in schools, right? And she was talking about why this is important that we have the prevent policy and why we have fundamental British values in schools. And I'm like, so is someone like Jacob Rees-Mogg, is he a potential terrorist? Has he been radicalized? You know, he's very anti same-sex marriage. He's very anti LGBTQI, but he comes from a particular section of the British establishment, the British political establishment. We, we talk about this differently in the UK, you know, there's, there's this kind of acceptance now in the political status quo that you know, homophobic, transphobic, biphobic sentiments are wrong, but there's a kind of double standard in the way it appears in Muslim communities. And I think that that side of the discussion was absent in most of the coverage of the Anderson Park protests. And as a gay Muslim, then I feel very caught in the middle. You know, this is my personal experience. It's like, you know, how do I how do I speak out about the very real homophobia that exists in Muslim communities? How do I challenge that? But also at the same time, how do I challenge this Islamophobia as well, this kind of co-optation of the LGBTQ argument to bait Muslims all the time? And progressive Muslim scholars always say, well, you know, this is from Islamic feminism, the Islamic feminist that I look up to will say, we always have to do multiple critique. This is just your reality. And this is very much, you know, along the lines of W.E.B. Du Bois, double consciousness, you know, black feminist thought, this um, Kimberly Crenshaw, you know, intersectional analysis. I think that that very much applies to LGBTQ Muslims as well, that there's always the need to critique more than one thing at the same time. And always feeling like you don't, in my case, at least feeling like you're not really doing justice either way. Am I still muted? No, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, we'll, um, just to throw another bit of terminology in there, um, but what you've really reminded me of there is kind of this idea of homo-nationalism, um, where kind of LGBTQ rights and existence is sort of weaponized, particularly against those that are seen as other and particularly against um, Muslim communities and as an Islamophobic tool um, in the UK, the US and elsewhere. And I'm wondering kind of with, with that weaponization of homo-nationalism and kind of the complicity of large slaves of more, more of the privileged members of the LGBTQ community, kind of how that erasure, is, is that a big challenge for the kind of work and kind of wanting to speak out? Is this sort of erasure that that inevitably results in? where you're kind of in a position where you have to choose which identity you want to be your primary identity almost um, in order to fit into one of those things or is there is it more complicated than that? Um, yeah, I think it creates, you know, a self divided against itself sometimes. Um, and I mean, I'm not gonna stick with the problem for a long time because you know that there is a particular joy that I get from being both gay and Muslim as well I'll talk about that in a minute but yeah I mean this kind of feeling divided against yourself um, and we see it repeated over and over again so you know you remember the Pulse shootings the Orlando shootings the Pulse massacre um, of course that was horrible and lots of my um, queer Muslim friends were of course utterly traumatized by that as well but then they became re-traumatized by the kind of Islamophobic rhetoric that came out of that, right, um, during that time. This is the months before the election of Donald Trump as president. Um, so I think, yes, you're right. It creates just various levels of silencing. Um, and I think this is where the, the very 
the completely apologist, traditionalist, you know, status quo Islamic position shares a lot in common with the very, very Islamophobic position, you know, like we can think about Katie Hopkins and so on, that kind of position. I think they share a lot in common because I think what both points of view say is that there can never be diverse interpretations of Islam. There can never be people from within the religion who challenge some of its own assumptions, right? So they take away that kind of agency, not just of LGBTQ Muslims, but, you know, Black Muslims, feminist Muslims, and so on. Um, and also, I think they they kind of, what, what they do in that situation is whenever someone comes out as a gay Muslim, I think then in liberal circles, they're always seen as a novelty, like, wow, a gay Muslim, how courageous, they're speaking out now. Or on the other side, it would be like, gay Muslims, this has never happened, this is disgusting, they're so influenced by the West. And they, you know, both, both, sides of the argument kind of ignore the fact that queer Muslims have existed for a long time in the history of Islam. They've been making themselves visible and heard in different ways, maybe not ways that are intelligible to us now, but you nevertheless ways that they, they became intelligible to the people around them and to themselves. Um, so it always creates this element of newness whenever someone talks about LGBT Muslims. I think that's probably the most damaging part of the silencing. Like it will never, it will always remain new. It can never be built upon. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, actually relating to what you said then um, just before. So there's this kind of the, the pre, hmm? am I frozen? Can you hear me? I can, I can hear you and see you. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so this idea that um, Islam and being queer are kind of diametrically opposed, oil and water can't fuse together, and you know that's not true, obviously. Um, and a lot of people know that's not true, because that's how you, that's your life. But so where, where do you get the joy from that? Where, what are your kind of joyful moments from that intersection? So... In a nutshell, it is Islamic feminism. I think when I was in my early 20s and I was going through a crisis of faith because I was coming to terms with my sexuality and wondering, well, do I have to choose one thing or the other? I discovered this group in Malaysia called Sisters in Islam. And they are, you know, many of them self-identify as Islamic feminists. And just discovering their work was um, a revelation to me. And a lot of the ways that I was thinking about social justice and being a Muslim and being gay suddenly made sense within that frame. So I think part of the joy for me is also knowing that um, it's not just about being gay or coming from the LGBTQI community. Lots of my Muslim women friends like when I meet them, when I speak to them, there's a sense of understanding each other and seeing each other that I think is so liberating, especially when we all share a certain degree of commitment to being Muslim as well, you know, um, whether it's very, very religious or not. So I thought maybe um, just to demonstrate one of the things that give me joy, I would like to share a video. So, you know, this was... Um, I think this was a few years ago, 2017 or something, there was a kind of Me Too movement that erupted within Muslim circles as well. I think a lot of people, maybe a few people on this call would have heard of Tariq Ramadan, who is the professor of Islamic studies at Oxford. Um, and, you know, he he's seen as a reformist Muslim in Europe, uh, but he takes quite conservative positions on sexuality and especially on LGBTQI uh, people in Islam. So then there were all these allegations of rape. You know, he's in a marriage, but there were allegations of rape and abuse and sexual harassment by lots of different women. And, you know, he's been on trial in France. And again, that's been quite disturbing because, you know, there have been, there've been real Islamic and xenophobic and Islamophobic under, undertones in that trial. But at the same, around the same time in the US, there's this Pakistani-American preacher, Numan Ali Khan, who again, 
you know, it's very slick, very charismatic, but promotes a really conservative ideal of sexuality and gender. Um, and then he was, again, he was married, but he was accused by his female followers of soliciting sex from them and just propositioning themselves, them. Um, and, it, you know, it's not to the level of Harvey Weinstein, but given his persona and what he stood for, that lots of Muslim women got quite disgusted by that. You know, even really, really devout women who were his followers started getting really disillusioned. Um, and then... And then I discovered this video. I'm just going to share it. Some of you might know this already, but if you do, it you might just really enjoy watching it again. I'm going to try and play as much of it as possible because um, there's something I want to say about it. <laughs> 